Today, we as human beings are faced with the results of having modified our natural environment to the point where it no longer favors an organized society. We have clear-cut our forests, poisoned our rivers, contaminated our air, and genetically modified our food beyond recognition, placing in the hands of our children the responsibility to restore the planet's ecosystem so that they may enjoy what we've already consumed. My name is Henry Miller. I'm the director and co-founder of a non-government organization called El Maiz Mas Pequeño, the smallest grain of corn. And I'm very grateful to be here tonight with you in order to talk about our organization's efforts in creating adaptive capacities to climate change and innovating mainstream public education in Mexico, one school at a time. But first, I'd like to talk about some experiences that have brought me here today. Both my parents were born in 1941, months before the U.S. involvement in what was to become the Second World War. From what I've been told, they met during childhood. They had their own individual experiences in travel, the military experience. They were married in October 1968. The first of their two children was born. Surrounded by the foreign and domestic issues and conflicts of that time, my parents retreated to the Green Mountains of Vermont and became part of a social movement then called and now remembered as the Back to the Land Movement. As a child, my parents instilled in me their own fundamental values of land stewardship, bringing me into contact with nature and allowing me to experience and later appreciate the relationship between my well-being and the well-being of the mountains and the forests that surrounded me. During my childhood, I was provided with a platform for my continued discovery of the natural world as an adolescent. I can remember venturing out in my neighbor's canoe unbeknownst to my mother in the middle of a lightning storm in the middle of the tornado season in central Illinois and walking in the woods on a moonlit winter night alone with my thoughts and the silence of snow. I don't often speak about my military service. What I can say in those four years is that I learned the value of peace and that freedom in many parts of the world is not free. What I wish to, to acknowledge, and for the purpose of this talk, I wish to acknowledge the military's efficiency in recruiting large groups of young people and training them to work as a team in order to achieve common goals in the face of urgency. As a meteorology major in university, I heard for the first time the term climate change. I learned of the scientific method and through the observation of migratory birds, I was able to understand the impacts of human activity on the structural and functional integrity of our atmosphere. In October 1995, I immigrated to Mexico, crossing the border between El Paso, Texas and Ciudad Juarez. And for nearly 25 years, I've dedicated my life to working with rural and indigenous peoples, serving as a bridge between government and non-government organizations, acquiring and transferring knowledge relating to the sustainable use of natural resources and the production of food. But the accumulation of these experiences that I've mentioned have provided me with the framework for teaching young people how to adapt to climate change based upon the following five-step strategy. The first step is to identify a simple conversation with a common vocabulary that allows a greater number of people to identify, explore the relationship between his or her own personal consumption and the territory that provides them with the ecosystem services that they consume. On a daily basis, we consume natural resources. Let's say water that has been distributed to our homes or made accessible to us. We transform that water using some other natural resource, be it gas or wood. We transform it into coffee or tea. We consume it. There is a satisfaction, and if you're like me, an immediate biological evacuation and a final absorption or contamination. Now let's talk about the territory where we do these things. 
and I'd like to define this territory as a watershed. This is a watershed. A watershed is a place that captures water, and a watershed has three functional zones. It has an upper part, a middle part, and a lower part. Like my hands, the watershed has a structure and a function. The biophysical structure of the watershed is comprised of rocks and minerals, soils covered with vegetation, grass and trees. The watershed has distinct functions in terms of being an ecosystem service provider. Some examples are the supply services, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil we cultivate, the genetics and the seeds that we sow, raw materials, the sand and gravel that we use to build our homes, the petroleum that is transformed into gasoline to fill our cars, regulatory services, the temperature and precipitation, regulating erosion and the filtration of water into our aquifers, support services like the nutrient cycle and habitat for animals such as migratory birds and butterflies and also for bacteria. Now when we modify the physical structure of our watershed, the functions will also be modified. And the results can always be measured by the change in the quantity and the quality of these e ecosystem services over time. And if we are to reverse the effects of these modifications, we must change our behavior, which brings me to step number two. Just so you guys know, this is uh, San Miguel in 1998, October of 1998. Step number two increase the efficiency in our decision making, which is comprised of three components. We must first have choices. We must first have a menu of options. Second component, we must have prior knowledge in order to know what is the best choice for us. And third, we must have the power to implement that which we choose. Step number three, occupy the spaces where decisions are being made. That means participating in student councils, community planning committees. Step number three, occupying the spaces where decisions are being made. That means participating in student councils, coalitions and community planning committees, and turning out the vote in local and federal elections. Next. Step number four, the implementation of best practices. The best practices on how to restore an ecosystem the best practices on how to produce food or regenerate depleted soils, or how to capture and filter rainwater for human consumption. The information is out there. Rocket science is no longer a secret. Step number five is the creation of networks, support and service networks, production and consumption networks such as community-supported agriculture, micro-savings and loans networks, putting the capital back in the hands of the people, such as young mothers without access to formal employment or education. Now that it's clear what is being done and where, in order for this story to take on its true meaning of urgency, it is important to recognize that when a high school student of today reaches my age of 51, there will be at least 9 billion people on the planet consuming the same natural resources and occupying the same watersheds and interacting with an at, within an atmosphere never be seen before by human eyes. I am convinced that there are an abundance of alternatives that go beyond the apocalyptic narrative of climate change. And education is the word. Each one, teach one. Muchas gracias.